Can I welcome members uh, present public to uh, the audit committee? And can I ask those present to ensure that all electronic items are switched to flight mode so that they do not affect the work of the committee? Uh, apologies have been received this morning from the convener, Hugh Henry, and also Tavish Scott. Uh, John Pentland, uh, we welcome to the meeting, will be attending as Hugh Henry's substitute. Welcome, John. Uh, first question is that we take uh, agenda items eight and nine and private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, the committee will now take uh, evidence on the 2013-14 audit of the Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts. And we'll take evidence this morning from Graham Dixon, Jonathan Price, Drew Sloan and Anne Moises. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, can I welcome the witnesses and invite them to brief the committee? I understand, Graham Dixon, that you wish to make an opening statement. Over to I, you. Thank you, convener. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I just wanted to remind the committee that the new common agricultural policy to be implemented next year is radically different from the existing one. The futures programme, which we're discussing today, will give us a new system that will ensure the safe delivery of nearly £4 billion of support to our farming, food and rural affairs sectors over the next five years. And the system will have a life uh, well beyond that. Uh, as well as necessary and desirable uh, business changes, the, the new system, together with the business changes, is going to form a challenging and complex programme. We've had to make many of the changes as a result of, of the EU, and we knew we'd be doing so against a very tight timetable. So for that reason, the Futures Programme has been fully within the sight of senior management in Scottish Government and our ministerial team right since the early stages of the programme. Um, the IT system is only part of the programme, but sound IT systems are required as a qualification for EU funding, since the systems themselves are not just the payments we make through it, need to meet EU auditors' tough requirements. Uh, one of the issues the, the Auditor General has reported to you is the increase in the cost of the programme from the original business case to the current one, and that's pride predominantly in our IT development. The other cost estimates we made are much closer. But when we agreed the initial business case in 2012, we didn't know the details of the new schemes, and nor did we foresee the complexity of the system we would need to build. The EU promised us a, a more simple cap, and in fact we'll have the most complex cap ever. And I believe that the new Agriculture Commissioner has acknowledged that. So it's not surprising we've had to keep our business case uh, under constant review and to amend it quite substantially. The second area the, the Auditor General raised is independent assurance. Um, the programme benefited from new procedures that we put in place following o Audit Scotland's report in 2012. Our Information Systems Investment Board used the Audit Scotland checklist when it considered the programme in 2012, and the programme itself has been subject to gateway reviews and regularly reported to our audit committees. The gateway reviews flagged a number of themes, some of which we'd identified ourselves. So, for example, last year we went out for, to recruitment for additional resources. We didn't have those staff in place by the time uh, of the May review, but we do now. Uh, we've also recognised there were issues with governance and planning, and again, that was not helped by the delay and the programmes being tied down by the EU. Uh, so in June this year, I asked for a rapid support team to be put in place to work with the management of the programme and address the issues that had been raised. And that has been successful. Uh, we completed a further gateway review in the last couple of weeks, and that records that we've made great progress and that we're in a much stronger position to tackle the challenges. In terms of progress, the, the programme itself has moved on from the Section 22 report. Uh, we've completed user acceptance testing of the first major piece of software. Um, the final part of that has now been integrated and is in testing it's all running on our new IT environment, and that will give us a solid underpinning for the programme. Um, it, we plan for the, the portal to go live to customers next month, and at that point, we'll be at a critical phase in the, the programme. The remaining releases of the software, those that will develop the functionality, sit on that platform, and they'll be fed out at regular stages next year. 
We've got a clear plan in place and it's being followed and we now also have an excellent team in place and we're working well with our IT partner who is giving us support at the highest level in the company. The one thing we don't have is spare time. That was always a challenge and it remains so, but I can assure the committee that this programme is an absolute priority for me as the accountable officer and indeed for our cabinet secretaries and it will remain so until it's completed. Thank you. Okay, I'm very grateful for, uh, for that. Uh, as you know, there were issues raised in our last evidence session uh, with the Auditor General, and uh, I think I go over to Bruce Crawford for, to start uh, the committee's questioning. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I just make sure, well, th th first of all, thank, thank you, Graham, for your introduction and bringing us up to speed on where the efforts being put in to make sure this is delivered as close to budget as we can, and Obviously, time scales are hugely important because a failure in this area would have a real problem for our farmers. I want to make sure, though, that we are talking about the, the accurate base figure to begin with. Now, I asked question when the Auditor General was here the last time to discuss this with us, and we've had a bit of paper from the Auditor General. I want to make sure that the Scottish Government now agree with the figures. Um, the original business case estimate, which was in paragraph 8 of the Cap Futures programme report suggested that that was 88 million, um, but we now have had a, an adjusted figure provided to us from the auditor um, that says that it's 102.5 million. Can I just confirm that that's now, that the, both the Auditor General and yourselves agree that figure? Yes. Okay. We have uh, agreed that figure with Audit Scotland. are happy it reflects the, the adjusted baseline that's helpful because it's still a there's still an increase there but it's not to the degree it had been previously as presented now um i want to have a and you, you rightly said this is going to deliver 3.9 million 3.9 billion pounds of payments through single farm payments to the srdp etc over the next i think it's over the next six five years now um can you tell me what is the percentage that you're expecting the the, co the overall cost of the programme to be of the cap budget, if you can tell me that, and also, what do you think the system lifetime will be? Because the previous system, if I understand it correctly, was about 20 year old that was falling over anyway, and was pretty moribund. So, you know, what is the sort of percentage number that we're talking about of overall cost? What's the lifetime of this system going to be? Obviously, depending on what happens in cap in future as well. And, and actually, on, on top of that, what, can you give me a, a reflection what's happening in the rest of the UK? Because this isn't obviously just a problem it's for, for Scotland, because everyone's facing these difficulties, not just in the, the, the UK, but rest, uh, around the rest of Europe. And I'd like to come to the European issue at some stage as well. Well, we never promised easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> you are, if you can break that down into ten sections. Um, while, while I answer Mr Crawford's point in the first couple, I'll let my colleagues work out the percentage. Um, you're correct, our current system, which we're still operating and which will make the payments to farmers this year, um, is about 20 years old. And if you think back to 1994 and the type of IT systems, it, it gives you a, an idea of, of, of why we needed to replace it. Um, we believe that the, the current system should last at least two programmes, which is, is what the current one, uh, sorry, the future programme, the futures system should last two programmes the same as the further one. The, the current one, which would be about 15 years. We have to depreciate it over a much shorter period uh, in our accounts, but, but we would expect maybe a 15-year a lifetime. So it's slightly under 3% of the current programme. Uh, and maybe I can ask Drew to explain the calculation in a minute. Um, well, I'll take that yeah. Let's not get into too much technical. Can I, can I just also say very welcome to supply written evidence to the committee if it takes too much time and calculations today. Thank you, convener. We'll, we'll, we might reflect the, yeah. the, our working and show it to the committee if, that help, if that's helpful. Um, I think the other thing, uh, if, if I could just add as a supplementary, Mr Crawford, in terms of the VAT, it's, you know, we, we have calculated that as a big amount. We challenged it because it's quite clear in the um, contracting out regulations that VAT for bespoke software should be recoverable. Um, HMRC, however, wrote us a 12-page letter 
explaining why it wasn't. But I think given the quantum of, of VAT, um, I'm inclined to go back and challenge that and, and, and we will take it up with our finance people as to whether we can get that money back because it would make quite a difference. In terms of the rest of the UK, um, I, I noticed that when the Auditor General gave you evidence, Mark Taylor, who's perhaps more in touch with the NEO and other organisations than we are, said that people in, in the rest of Europe were facing similar challenges. <clears throat> and we know, you know, with, we, we don't go into the detail in, in terms of other programmes in the way we do in this one, but we know that colleagues elsewhere in Europe are facing challenges through complexity, uh, not just in developing new systems, but in actually delivering uh, a complex system we have tried to keep uh, the changes we made in Scotland as simple as possible at our Cabinet Secretary's encouragement, but even so, it's going to be terribly complicated. I, I don't know whether Jonathan Price has just been meeting the, the European payment paying agencies. I don't know whether you want to add on what else is going on in Europe. Uh, yeah, I mean, if all, all, I'd, um, all I'd really add is to say that every um, paying agency across the whole of the European Union um, is facing its own challenges in, in how it implements the, uh, the new common agricultural policy. Um, there's a very, very strong consensus that the, um, the new policy is a very complex um, and it makes the implementation and delivery of those policies um, in an operational sense um, extremely complex and that's what we've been finding. Uh, we know that our colleagues in every part of the United Kingdom, as well as um, every part of, well, as we, we know for certain around um, other UK paying agencies, uh, that each are finding it in their own different ways difficult. Um, and as I say, um, other European countries are finding different elements of it, whether it's keeping the mapping up to date, whether it's the detail, not all of which do we yet have from the European Commission. We're still having regular teleconferences with Commission officials. Um, to be able to establish the, the detailed interpretation of what um, Europe has set out in the regulations. Um, so all of these things um, continue to make this a challenging, a challenging set of policies that we're, that we're working on, and certainly we're not alone in finding, finding it so. Can, okay, thank you. Uh, on the European issue, now, at the, at the, when we had the um, Audit Scotland people in front of us previously, I, I was able to quote from the European Court of Auditors' opinion which said that the courts doubted as to whether the measure proposed can be implemented effectively without imposing an excessive administrative burden on managing agencies and farmers. Now, that's there. It's real. You've reflected that in what you've been telling us. The question in my mind is now, how do we now learn the lessons from this, not just as what happened in Scotland, but how can we, across the European Union, learn the lessons for this? Because if there are extra burdens, extra costs, extra inefficiencies... Get, or, or extra issues having to be dealt with here in Scotland, the cost across the whole of the European Union must be enormous. So wh what processes do we get involved in, as, or, or do you get involved in as a Scottish Government to try to make sure that the, I'm assuming it's the Commission, are learning the lessons here of this yeah. incredibly <coughs> complicated process they've landed us with? And the, the new Commissioner coming in has, I, I, I don't know, you know has, has perhaps been horrified by this and, and said that, you know, there is massive complexity, and I think his initial approach was to say we needed to take measures to simplify it. But of course, when you're so far down the road, beginning to reverse it could cause even more problems. Um, but I, I, you know, do you want to yeah, continue I mean, what we're doing, John? I suppose. I suppose what I'd, what, what I'd add is that um, you know, we need to start now thinking about uh, the next common agricultural policy that will begin in 2020. Um, and make sure that we're in at the in at the beginning, uh, making these points, uh, and and we shall be. The um, I think the Commission is learning lessons from this in terms of quite how um, the the policies developed. Um, this was the first time that the European Parliament had a a competence in relation to the Common Agriculture Policy. Um, so the very complicated co-decision process between the Commission, the Council of Ministers and the European um, Parliament itself um, has created the space to allow a lot more complexities to be added in. Obviously, each party tends to want to um, 
have their own particular ideas included. And I'm afraid that what we've ended up with is um, far too many options, far too many um, different elements, that some of which are compulsory, some of which are optional. But as soon as they're optional, then um, in the domestic space, we get, we, we get lobbying um, by different um, sets of interest groups. Um, so all of these things, I think it's been quite a shock across Europe, um, quite how the, the, this whole process went over the last three years. Um, and I'm pretty confident that we'll all learn something from that, and then we'll, then we'll take it from there. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out that the, um, the European Court of Auditors um, report was in 2012. A lot of the complexity has been added since then, so it's a, it will be a lot more than 15%. Okay, uh, again on the lessons learned issue, um, because obviously there's lots of learns, issues uh, learning to be done here. I'm sorry to quote Colin Beatty's question and answer session he had with the Auditor General last time, but the Auditor General said in response to a question from Colin that it was practically impossible to let a contract that a fixed price at the outset and cross increases the work develops. Is there a different way we can do this in future to make sure? The, the, the type of contract we're drawing up takes account of the, and I'm not sure if this is possible, but it takes account of the complexity that can come at a later stage, because that would hopefully save some additional costs that were being borne. Um, I, I think that I'll ask Anne Moises, our Chief Information Officer, to tell you about what we do in other areas. Uh, the issue, we, if, if we were going into a normal uh, process where we had it in our own hands, we wouldn't have done it this way, clearly we would have specified our requirements much more clearly in advance uh, and gone in to negotiate uh, with a contractor to help us deliver something in, as a fixed price for what we wanted. The problem was we didn't know at the start, and I think Mr Coffey in, in his interventions last time I read said, you, know, you build something when the customer tells you what you want and you start off thinking you're building a house and end up building a block of flats. So we, in, in other areas, and if, if I could ask Anne to, to give you a couple of examples, we do have a, a, a fixed price contract, but in this case, we've had to adopt a system of, uh, of building things incrementally. And at each stage of that increment, we have an open price with a contractor where you know, we, we talk about the specification for that part and then tie it down and then move on. So it's, it's a very difficult process to manage. But if it would help the committee, we can give you an example of, some of what we would normally do if we were starting ourselves. Effectively, um, I would always prefer fixed price contracts and then to subsequently keep change control to a minimum. Um, so we do let a lot of fixed price contracts, but we tend to do that when we have a very clear idea of the specification. So we know exactly what size and shape of house we're building and where we know that there will be le relatively little disturbance or change during the life of the build, so that we've got a clear idea of, of when we start, what we're delivering, and the time scales, and ideally relatively short time scales. Um, and in those particular occasions, fixed price normally works really well. Um, we've got a track record of quite a number of in-house and fixed price contracts that have been delivered completely to time and budget. None of those are as complex as the cap reform. And if we had gone fixed price at the start of this, as Graham suggested, um, the amount of change control would have been unbelievable. And companies tend to make quite a large margin on change control, as you're aware. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, just looking at uh, timescales and so on here, the original business case was approved in December 2012. Now, obviously, there have been some months before that while that was being developed. The IT partner didn't come on board until March 2013. In retrospect, would it have been helpful if an IT partner had been identified and taken on at the time the business, sheet, the business uh, plan was getting put together? I realise there were issues with uh, information coming from the EU. I think the, the gap between... We, we agreed the business case in December 12... We then uh, went out to tender, and I think there's a fixed tender time, so it was in March 2013, only about three months later, that we appointed an IT partner, and then they started work shortly after that. I think it would have been difficult to compress the time scale any more, given that we need to go to tender on these things. 
it just seems a little bit difficult putting a business case together when IT costs are really something you're pulling out of the air, in effect. And we can see that, obviously, IT, the increase in IT costs is a major part of this, uh, this overrun. Uh, yes, we took... Uh, it, it's very difficult when you have to go to competition to work with one preferential supplier to work them out. So in, in assessing those costs in the business case, uh, we used our advisors at that point and we also took soundings from uh, a range of, of other people in terms of what the likely cost of such a system would be. Uh, the difficulty was that you know, there was no comparable system out there uh, of this complexity. And so, you know, they, as they, the figures clearly show, despite having a lot of caveats in the business case, you know, we undersized what that cost would be. Is it, would it be true to say that every single country in the EU is going to be individually developing some sort of system to, to cope with this? It seems remarkably inefficient. Uh, uh, one of the, the reasons that each country does something differently is because they have a different agricultural system, a different geography. Their stakeholders, as Drew said, you know, ask them to tailor things to different uh, places. So even within the UK... Um, the cap we will be implementing is quite different from England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I'm glad, I hope, I'm confident in saying ours is simpler <laughs> than those two other. But I, guess, I guess what I was moving to is, is there any way to save costs by sharing with others? Uh, that's something we have looked at historically, even 20 years ago when we did the current system, we looked at that. Uh, and there has been nothing that has emerged EU-wide that provides a system of this, you know, that deals with the complexity and the different range of things you need to deliver. Notwithstanding the, the huge increase in IT costs, uh, you are taking out of uh, out of the pl planning uh, a number a number of key functional areas or, or functionalities from the system. How is that going to impact? Is it does it mean that there's going to have to be workarounds for that? Are you scheduling in for the future to capture these? You were saying that, uh, I think you said that uh, this, this present system would be good for two sessions of whatever fur further on down the line. How, how does all that work? Uh, there are a number of uh, things that, that have been changed from the original plan, and uh, if, if I can let Drew say a bit more detail. The first thing we did is the, we have a land parcel information system which handles the half a million fields that we have in Scotland that, uh, that has to, uh, that's a key control in terms of our payments. Uh, we have modified our existing LIPIS system uh, to help uh, buy us some time in this one. And the functionality that will be lost is that uh, instead of farmers or farm agents going online and amending boundaries, uh, we will need to, to do them ourselves. They will, um, uh, they will be able to see them on the screen but not do anything. Uh, the second thing we've taken out is uh, we currently use mobile technology for mapping those field boundaries where our inspectors go out with kit on their back and a, and a laptop. We'd hope to extend that into doing animal inspections uh, and some other things. So we've de-scoped the animal inspections part of it. And I think we've also taken out the ability to do SMS messaging to people. So uh, other than the first one, which we've redesigned, um, they're fairly minor things which we will bring in at a, at a further stage. Um, but just to style me as further, the Commission recently specified that we would need to bring in a new and different land parcel information system from 2016. So we will have to go out and make a further substantial amendment as a result of that change. So there are costs going to come down the line, IT costs going to come down the line that are not yet quantified? The cost of, the, of a new land parcel information system is, has not been quantified and is not in those figures. I wouldn't want to make a guess at what the SMS messaging and animal inspections would add, but I imagine they're fairly minor. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I'd add a few comments. Sorry, this one. Um, I think, as you can see, in the business case is driven very strongly by making farmer payments 
being compliant, avoiding disallowance, and us being efficient and customer focused as the efficiencies we need to, to get are about 20% to avoid our costs increasing. And really this, this area of, of de-scoping is pragmatic because delivering farmer payments and disallowance drive the business case in front of our own efficiency, which is where some of these things come in. So it's a very pragmatic decision to meet those first deadlines. And as, as Graham mentioned, the land parcel information system, we were had a much higher chance of being compliant in 2015 with the current system and some slight upgrades than we ever had of replacing it as the original business case. So we had to take that decision to make sure 2015 is successful. The Commission has brought in these new upgraded rules through the Delegated Acts, the Implementing Acts that we didn't find out until June this year, and we'll have to revisit and have a, a new system for 2016. All the other, or anything else that's de-scoped, is so minor in what we have to do for 2015. I'm very relaxed it'll come in later, and the, the priority of the programme is not to block the development. Don't do something that stops you doing those things later, is the priority of the programme at the moment, because they're small. I'm looking at page 8 of the Audit Scotland report, uh, 19, the second bullet point. There's mention made there, more detailed planning is still to be developed for the remaining programme period. Does that imply additional costs? I think what, uh, they... The detailed planning is, um, is the... Uh, the plan itself as to how we would roll these things out and the, uh, each stage of each little software drop. So we, we have a high level plan right through to December 2015. And within that planning deadline, we have a, a detailed plan for each of the software drops. So through to the, the next one in March next year, we have you know, enormous planning detail for the programmers. I think what Audit Scotland is saying in the report is that we need to do the, that similar work for each of the successive pieces of software drop. It doesn't necessarily imply that there will be additional costs on it. It's just saying you need to get these planning things tied down firmly. As you know, Audit Scotland did raise this as a Section 22 report, uh, really on the basis that they were concerned about the costs uh, and progress, and they highlighted the risks over several years, not just this year. So I thank Colin Beatty for that point. Uh, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to you, uh, uh, Mr Dixon. I, I certainly raised the, the problems of the change in specifications, the uh, requirement specifications last time, and I'd just like to pick up on one or two of those issues with you again this morning, if I could. Uh, it's probably unusual for some of our witnesses to receive a sympathetic <laughs> hearing at a public audit committee in the Scottish Parliament, but I have great sympathy for what you have appeared to face here. Uh, there is nothing worse if you're a software engineer and, and, and uh, trying to design a system only to discover that it's growing arms and legs as you work through the process and, and the difficulties that it can bring upon you. But y you said in your opening remarks, uh, Mr Dixon, that sound IT systems are a requirement for the qualification for payments. Now, my first important question, I think, is have we complied with what the EU require of us now to enable this process to, to continue smoothly and for the payments to be made? Well, ultimately, we won't know that till they audit them. But um, in terms of the, I mean, just going backwards from, from the land parcel information system, um, we, were, we received disallowance under the current programme because the auditors uh, said that that system, which is a key control, was not compliant, and that's why, as Drew said, you know, we have worked, having got that into a compliant form, we have kept that and modified it to use in the current programme, so there is a very high degree of confidence there. In terms of the, uh, the main part of the system, you know, we are building it with that compliance in mind, and, uh, and I think part of the Part of the, the reason for the complexity is not just the rules that have come in on the programmes themselves, but you know, the basic portal which we will launch next month um, has to meet those requirements as well. So things like um, handling the fact that we have farmers who go online and claim, we have agents and we also have agents who act for farmers who are farmers themselves. Um, we have complex uh, conflict of interest rules. So if we have staff who have got relatives or friends or neighbours 
then the system has to stop them interacting with it. Um, and we have a whole degree of security. You know, this is a system that will deliver hundreds of millions of pounds a year. So it has to be you know, um, proof from attack from outside. Some testing of that is currently going on. So they, you know, even the complexity of a portal itself uh, to meet those audit requirements is pretty high. And, and that's why you know, it has grown the arms and the legs even in the starting stages of it. But we're building it with, with that, um, with the audit rules in mind. And, uh, you know, are, are pretty confident that that's, that's what we will deliver, is something that will meet those very high standards. Is it reasonable to ask you how much of that complex complexity or any of it could have been anticipated, given the political discussions that were happening within the European Union about CAP? I mean, I think it was expected that there were going to be changes. So, and you, you mentioned the 20-year-old IT system, which in my experience it only does what it ever did and it doesn't do anything else. It, it, is it fair to ask you how reasonably prepared we might have been or should have been or could have been to anticipate some of the changes that came to us? Um, I'll let Drew. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I'm just to take you through the full story, if you know the timeline, it was October 2011, the first uh, document was published by the Commission. And so it was in the early parts of 2012, it was this realisation that this is really big. And so we put teams together in the spring of 2012 to start the work on it. And it took from then to December for the business case to say this is not just a tweak to the current system. So your observation is absolutely correct. It's like this system can't cope and it'd be more expensive and probably not be audit proof to try and make it cope. So that's where some of your evolution of get to December 12 and say this is not a... There had been a... a a possibility that you kind of develop new stuff alongside your own stuff in small incremental steps was one of our consultants' views, and it was clear that wasn't going to go. So that's why you got to December 12, which is a question from Mr. Beatty, why the, the IT partners in, in March 13. And that complexity continued to increase through the, the negotiations. So we could see some of it coming, but until the Scottish Government makes its decision in June at Parliament, you'd we don't know exactly which bits of the possible complexity we'll choose and which bits we'll avoid. And I think going back to Mr Crawford's question, what lessons to learn, what I think the committee can take comfort from is that, that this government and the Cabinet Secretary has absolutely had the policy colleagues and the implementation colleagues in the room together at all times. And that's a benefit as a pain agency, the implementation part of it, that not all our colleagues across Europe get. And we didn't get in the 2005 reform, when I first joined the company, it was clear it was thrown over the hedge from policy. So while it is very complex, as an implementation team, we were at the table, were listened to, and so the package we have could have been even more complex. There's nothing in our final version that we feel can't be programmed into a computer or maintained by farmers. And there were choices that could have been taken and other countries have taken where we believe it's virtually impossible to keep it audit compliant and deliver the payments had certain choices that were options been taken. So that was kind of, you can preempt some of it, but we started in May 12 with a, a large team really looking at it and you couldn't really finalize till June 13. And some of the verifications you asked in your previous question are still negotiations with Europe going on as to what we'll have to put into the verifications that we launch in the summer next year. So it is iterative. We've got the application form in build, it'll be ready to go, but how we verify that data for audit proof is still awaiting decisions by the EU now. Thank you. Thanks for that. That's very helpful and very fair. You also mentioned um, that user acceptance testing had been completed, and um, I wanted to ask you, who are the users and who else needs to be in the process of acceptance testing? I presume from your comments here, Mr Sloan, that the, the Commission in some way needs to have oversight of the systems that they're fit for purpose to deliver what we think they should be delivering. Um, no, audit. No. Uh, the, the EU have a great way of saying this is the regulation, we'll come and see you later and see if you've complied. So no, they wouldn't offer any help. What they have done, new in this process, is they are... Uh, vetting the policy decisions we've taken to make sure we've not misunderstood the regulation from the policy decision. And that's why some of the work is still ongoing to say, you've chosen this option, it's incompatible with another one, you can't do this. So there is EU help there, but not on the implementation for our side. So the user acceptance testing is um, through customer focus groups, find out what people want, working with uh, 
people in the business. So it's the business requirements, people, product owners, with a separate UAT team checking that we've got what we asked for, which was fed from customer focus groups. So it's a classic internal UAT. Um, we haven't gone to any friendly customers yet, and that's part of the, the, the soft launch uh, next month. Okay, very last point, convener. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Price just mentioned that we need, we need to be in at the beginning before the next change in 2020. Uh, it was a general question about when the European Union makes or thinks it's about to make a major political change that clearly has an impact of systems and processes that deliver and drive that. How, how, how better can we engage at a system level to make sure that the, the political decision make, makers are fully, fully aware of what they're doing and the impact that it has on delivering systems to, to carry through those policies? Because it seems to me that's a classic case of politicians making a decision and not really being fully aware of the impact of the, what that will have in systems to deliver that. I and mean, it's a very fair point. I think we don't yet have that that relationship completely cracked. What we do have are networks across the European Union, um, again, of other paying agencies, um, where we share our experiences. So we have that. We have we have a paying agencies directors um, conference every six months, uh, where we get a, tr a chance to share on policies. But there are also um, regular meetings of IT professionals from across the paying agencies, again, approximately twice a year, uh, where there's an opportunity to, sh to share um, and also to form views as to how, how these things could be done better. Um, I think where the disconnect at the moment is that there's not a significant link between either of those forums into the political decision-making process within the Council of Ministers. Uh, indeed, the previous commissioner uh, was quite upset in 2013 uh, when a report from our, I think it was April 2013 um, conference, was highlighting the complexities and countenancing that, that, that the council should do something to um, to simplify. Um, and he was very put out that um, operational staff, paying agencies, should be taking a view on this when it was in in the political space. Um, the other thing that we have to, that, that that we find. Um, increases the complexity of the technology requirements is that there is a group called the, I think it's the Joint Research Council um, within the European Union uh, that um, sets the standards for mapping and for, for remote sensing. Um, and they are very keen to use the common agricultural policy and the regulations that go with that um, to require countries to do what we would see as gold plating around um, the, 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 the level of detail of the mapping uh, that we're asked to do in order to control um, the, uh, the, the, the activities of farmers, uh, certainly at a, at a more detailed level than would be required simply to ensure that uh, the money was being put out in a, in a properly, um, uh, properly controlled and, and uh, defensible way. Uh, so we tend to find that we're responding, and I think this um, uh, the, the upgraded um, LPIS system that we're being asked to bring in by 2016 is one of those things that it will be helpful, but to make it a mandatory requirement in 2016 is a degree of um, asking more than I think they needed to do. We thought we would have until 2018 and they brought it forward to 2016 and, and I'd say that just adds to the, the complexity and the challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I just say that although uh, my colleague Willie Coffey said that he does have sympathy for uh, the changing IT spec, um, can I just say you don't get all sympathy from this committee? Obviously, it's not our job. And can I just, before going to Kenneth McIntosh, ask you two points that are in the committee that uh, in the report, which I think wouldn't lead to sympathy. And one is... Uh, the Auditor General uh, highlighted that the Scottish Government has estimated it could incur costs of up to 50 million a year if the IT system failed to deliver the requirements of CAP reform. I don't think you'd get much sympathy here for a uh, 50 million fine. So just to let us know where you are on uh, that issue. And uh, the other issue where I think you would incur even less sympathy is if the farmers uh, weren't paid on time. And that point is highlighted in page seven, uh, key stakeholders um, have acknowledged that the new complexities arising from CAP may affect the usual timetable 
the target for making payments. So on those two issues, and before I go to Kenneth McIntosh, can you just uh, tell us where you are on the 50 million and farmers' payments? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Convener. They, I, I don't think I'd even get as far as the committee if that happened. I think I'd... <laughs> Um, the, the 50 million is a figure we put into the, to the benefits uh, that we track as part of the programme. So as, as well as the costs uh, that we deliver, we, um, we have a, a, an ongoing list of what we would expect in return. And that was a, a rough estimate of, of a typical fine that the EU might, um, uh, that might levy on you if you get something wrong. So by avoiding that, we say we've got a benefit. Um, Drew and his team have, have done a further calculation in terms of looking at the um, if, if we did not get the system right and we incurred the typical penalty that um, somebody at the Rural Payments Agency in England has incurred in the current programme, then we would be disallowed about £35 million a year for the whole programme. So that's, that's what we're trying to avoid by getting in place a sound system that meets all the EU audit requirements. Do you give this committee any comfort that it is likely to be avoided? Uh, if, if we get to this, the system is designed to avoid yeah. having those fines levied on us, uh, and our programme and how we deliver it and keeping it as simple as possible is designed to, to avoid being pay, paying any... This was Yes. by the Auditor General, so sufficient changes have been brought in that gives you a confidence that we are likely to avoid yes. what you call fines of either 35 or 50 million. Yes, did you? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, can, I can answer uh, some of the short-term concerns. Um, we, it's very hard to predict exactly what the EU will fine you. They have arbitrary, sometimes 2%, 5%, 10%. But in our view, the first big deadline is customers being able to apply to the new CAP. If they miss the deadline of a application, then we would automatically be fined something, and farmers would expect not to forgo their total payments. So there is a huge risk around the first deadline, which is May the 15th, 2015. So we have to have the core um, portal with all the security that uh, Graeme mentioned, and we have to have the application form ready and confidence over the last three, four months. Certainly, <coughs> you haven't got evidence since the, the Auditor General's report, which was based on the May report. Confidence in those early releases that get the farmers to the application form has risen dramatically. And we're in the, the final throes of that and um, where build will complete for that in the next three and a half weeks. And we need to do that to achieve the opening of the application window. And the That's the first big deadline, first big disallowance deadline. Then, in European terms, dealing with the disallowance point first, the next big deadline is June 2016. That's the closing of the payment window when, as a paying agency, we must make the payments or the liability would potentially fall to Scottish Government and they would fine you anyway. And that's where we look at the Rural Payments Agency in England showed us what failure looks like in the 2005 reform and, have a, and our equivalent would be averaging £35 million uh, pounds disallowance a year. So we've got that June deadline, that's the backstop, and we have time and have a plan that's well ahead of that, because as you say, the plan is not for June 16, the plan is for December 15, when farmers normally expect their payments. And so that's what the current plan currently shows and what we're working towards. And the caveat is that stakeholders um, in various meetings acknowledged that they wanted to get the policy right, even if that meant putting the first year's payments a somewhat at risk on the timetable. They don't want to put them at risk, but they acknowledged, don't just go for the simplest model and guarantee payments if that would be the wrong policy for Scotland. Our budget is very tight. I'm sure you've been very aware of the, the lack of budget that we got. So the efficiency of the use of budget demanded by stakeholders, and I would say generally backed by the, the Parliament, I think, I don't just follow who was backing what, um, has added some complexity where there's acknowledgement that it'll be very challenging. But we're working to the disallowance is a May 15 deadline, June 16, and farmers is in between. There was a, a risk highlighted by the Auditor General last month. You're giving us an assurance this month that uh, farmers will be paid uh, in December uh, 
2015 in the usual timetable and that you're back on track not, not all payments. of not all of that. I said we're we're on track for the first deadline for yes, March for fifteen Ma to let farmers apply by yes. May fifteen. We have a plan to deliver by December, but I can't sit here and give assurance that they will go exactly to plan between now and then. Okay, right. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing this in private mm -hmm. session following the meeting. Kenneth McIntosh. Thank you, Kavita. Um <coughs> The the questions so far have talked about the complexity of the European programme and the Auditor General uh, addressed that in a report but the reason she reported was not just the complexity of EU uh, demands, it was what she called the management shortcomings. Do you accept her criticism? Um, I think the, there were two aspects to that. Uh, the first in my reading was in terms of the staffing that we had in place and the resources we had in place. When we went into the, the programme initially, uh, we used the Audit Scotland check checklist. Uh, we believed that we had the correct level of resource allocated to the programme. As the complexity began to roll out, probably about this time last year, um, I took the view with Jonathan Price that we needed to bring in more resource. So we went out to market. We have brought in uh, for highly experienced people to supplement it. We're satisfied that we've got, through our IT partner, the good programming skills that we needed. Um, so in terms of could we have done it better, I, I think we, if, we, if, we had, if we knew now what we knew then, we'd have gone to the market sooner to get more people in place. We've got them, uh, and the gateway review we've just had done acknowledges that we have got a good level of resource and a good team in place. The second thing that, uh, that was mentioned in the report is around the governance of the programme, uh, and that was something which came up in the gateway review, that we weren't entirely clear uh, whether it was an IT programme or a, or a business change programme in our agricultural staff or both together that we're managing <clears throat> the, the Gateway Review said we should do something to address that. Uh, it was not done to their satisfaction or mine in May this year, which is why we put in a team to help advise uh, Jonathan, Drew and the staff how they could turn that around. And again, over the course of a couple of months, we have done that. The Gateway Review has picked up the fact that we have, um, we are in a, a a much better or very good shape to do that. So I'm satisfied that the action we have taken has addressed the Auditor General's concerns and that when the auditors come back, I hope they will agree with the Gateway team that we have got, you know, we have, we have addressed any of the shortcomings in her report. Yeah. yeah you, you made, said there was two. There was actually three, I think, points that uh, she made in the report. Uh, the first was that there was insufficient capacity and capability the second, that there was a lack of programme plan and critical path. And the third, uh, on the integration of the whole programme and lack of consistent approach. And I think that the, one of the concerns that uh, the Auditor General raised and that certainly uh, was shared by this committee was that these are the very same issues that were raised in, by the Auditor General in our 2012 report managing ICT contracts. Now, Am I right in thinking you were aware of that report, the difficulty the government has in managing IT, before you started down this, uh, this particular programme? Uh, yes, I, as I said in my uh, opening remarks, we used that Audit Scotland checklist. Uh, our Information Systems Investment Board uh, used that checklist to assess the programme when it looked at the business case, and at that point, you know, they were satisfied, I assume, in, in the case. As things have rolled out and become more complex, we have gone back and we have looked at the issues of governance and resourcing and addressed them. Um, I didn't pick up the Auditor General's third point, which is around planning. Uh, it's very difficult with a programme of this nature, which does it in short bursts, to have a detailed end-to-end -end plan. <clears throat> we have now got... Um, we have a high level plan right through to December 15. And as we do each of these bursts of software, we have a detailed plan in place for it. The assurance process suggested good practices to have something called a plan and a page, 
we have a plan and a page now. It's a, an E3 page because it's so big and so complex. So again, sorry, that was part of the work we did in the spring to address those concerns. I think uh, Mr Crawford asked you earlier, you know, what lessons we could learn from this particular um, process or this project. But the point is that the lessons should have been learned already. Well, why were they not? If there's been IT problems like this before, or the governance of IT projects, projects by the government uh, have led to exactly these same problems, why were the lessons not learned in the first place before you started? Why did you have to wait till the things went wrong? I think uh, what I was trying to explain is that when we went into this, we believed that we were going to deliver a big programme, but not necessarily the one of the complex they were doing now. Uh, and that, that when we scoped it, when we looked at the lessons learned, we put the resources in place. Um, within a few months of the contractor coming in and is beginning to deliver it, we realised this was going to be a much tougher, much more difficult programme than we envisaged at the beginning. So we then took the action to address the fact that we were living with um, probably a much more complex programme than we've ever delivered before, which is why we've had to, to bring in substantially more senior people than we envisaged at the beginning. So my view is we, we had right-sized it for what we were starting with. It became a much bigger project, and we have now addressed those concerns and put the resources in place. It's not entirely an EU-driven project, is it? Because the, um, from the start, there was a decision was taken to add other, uh, to try to get other benefits from this programme, including the land mapping and the, the mobile technology and so on. Uh, whose decision was that? Was that taken by the senior management team? Was it taken by the minister? At what stage was that taken? Yep. Yeah. I'm being told by Dr Price it's the senior management team, but the, the benefits are are part of um, delivering a better service to farmers and getting more efficiency out of our staff. The land parcel information system is a basic requirement of the European Commission. We have to have a detailed database of the half a million fields in enormous detail. We have the mobile technology in place for doing that part of the inspection. One of the business benefits was extending it to doing animal inspections. So it, there were, I, I don't think there was any gold plating on it. It was improving service and improving our business efficiency. But the point is you've dropped all those parts. We're not going to get any of these benefits. So it, that seems to me that they were unnecessary. You were adding something to the project that was unnecessary at the beginning. I, I know Drew wants to come in, but I, I, I hope we explained in our previous evidence that a couple of the benefits that have been dropped and that we'll bring back later um, are fairly minor. They're not high cost. The main uh, issue we faced was around how we got a compliant land parcel information system in place. Uh, and we have modified the current system rather than build a completely new one. So that will be in place. But subsequent to that, we have now been told that we will need to put a completely new system in place because of changing EU requirements. But if I've... Did you want to add to that, Drew, or have I got... No, that? I was really just referring to the previous answer. The, the, the LIPUS is a key control within the EU, and we believed the successful path for 2015 at December 13, the decision was taken, was to continue with the current one with very slight upgrading, and subsequently the Commission has shown us that we need significant upgrading, um, and therefore a new one has to come back into scope, that, and it was acknowledged that's not in the current cost. Um, but the, the the drive for some of it being high technology is because during the last couple of years there's also been a drive to the, the level of maintenance and accuracy you have to have in there, as, as, as Jonathan mentioned, is beyond anything you would imagine as to the accuracy we have to have on the ground of all features on all maps. And we're trying to push that into the farmers' hands because they're the ones that are there every day, rather than us looking at aerial photographs, ordnance surveys that's always out of date. So there's a whole technology drive to be more compliant and more efficient and more customer focused. And that will have to come in from the regulations. The other de-scoping, in my mind, is very peripheral. Very peripheral. And I think, I think the community recognises what you're saying. And the difficulty is that it's these additional uh, features that have added to an already complex system. They've now been dropped, but the cost has risen, so we're getting no benefits, and it's actually jeopardised the future of the project itself. Am I right? No, I 
So there's not. So there's there's no there's no jeopardy to this program at all. This program is on course. It will be delivered on time. I think the what you're saying is that did these features add to the jeopardy? Yes. No. I mean, did we they have the complexity. They added to the complexity and the major part of it. We de-scoped early on. The other two minor factors uh, around the uh, animal inspections and MMS we took out, but were not a big part of it. Uh, as we said earlier, we are in a better place now than we were early to give you the assurance that we will have the first part of it up and running next month. We are now in a much more confident position to say that the, the next stage where the application forms are online for farmers will be in, uh, in March 2015, and we have a plan to work through the successive bits of the software to deliver them on time. When is your um, cut-off point if uh, you've got a deadline of May next year, May 2015, uh, at what point are you going to uh, agree that this programme is going to work and you're going to go with it? At what point are you going to abandon ship and put in place the contingency plans that the Auditor General refers to? One of the uh, decisions we will need to make probably in the next month or two uh, is to whether you know, that is a risk that we need to address. So it will be something that will come fairly quickly. Uh, it's not something uh, that we would make lightly, uh, and we would do so in the light of the current information. Uh, and as Drew said, the, you know, the programme team meets every morning. We keep a close track on progress. So by the time we've gone through another month, I'd hope that the assessment uh, in terms of deliverability of the application forms will be even higher, uh, and we will not need to make that decision for contingency. Yeah. Uh, and just in terms of cost, um, clearly the original estimates, the, the, the original estimates were out by, well, at least 25% initially. That's in May, when you put in the gateway review. But after the gateway review, costs rose again by another well, £10 million. Pounds. Have costs risen since then? There are a couple of items uh, which are not in the current business case for the examination of contingency, which was agreed by ministers a couple of months ago. Uh, and there will, we will need to scope in the costs of putting in a new land parcel information system. Neither of those are in the, the business case. But we, we keep our business cases up to date. There is an, a review of one coming in shortly. We report our costs regularly. They, they go regularly to the programme board. Uh, if things increase without a particular margin, they're flagged up. If it's within uh, a certain margin, then they have to be reported to ministers. Uh, Dr Price and I meet two cabinet secretaries pretty well every month to keep them up to date on this project, to appraise them of any deviation from our plan and any risk to the costs. So the costs, as, as this committee knows them from July 2014, is that the costs are already 34% uh, higher than originally estimated. But you're saying that since then the costs have risen again? There, are, there is one particular item which uh, we have incurred and one which we know we will need to incur in future. But against that, we're also working, particularly with our IT delivery partner, to look at ways that we can mitigate cost and to keep down the pressure as much as possible in the programme. Give us a cost at the moment, a final outturn cost. Uh, I can't give you a final outturn cost, I'm afraid. Yeah, you don't have a final budget forecast for this project. I think we were we would rather work through our business case at the next stage uh, and look at all the contingency options and others before we come down to a final figure. So at the moment, the 137 million, it's going to be higher than that, but you don't know how much higher. We don't know precisely, no. Okay. Could I just ask, convener, I wonder through you whether uh, whether you could share those costs with the committee when they become available. Um, you know, if you're having a review and you're going to have these costs, I think the committee would want to know how much has risen again. My final question is: uh, there's a, the figure of 50 million. If we don't get this right, has been mentioned, but that's just one estimate. It could be higher than that, couldn't it? Uh, in theory, the the EU uh, tends to bring in blanket disallowances of 2.5% or 10%. Uh, we 
wood in our, in our record in the past is I think we average over this program about 1.2% disallowance, which is um, better than probably most of the rest of the UK uh, and uh, certainly puts us you know, well in the middle of the field in Europe. So our aim is to keep this allowance to an absolute minimum. Uh, and that's not just you know, having the IT system complex, uh, the IT system deliver the program, it's keeping the program complexity as low as we can. And a big part of it too is, uh, I mean, Drew's staff of agriculture inspectors are a big part of that. So getting the thing delivered aside from the IT system is one of the skills in this and we will, our, our aim is to keep that disallowance to an absolute minimum. Thank you very much. Thank you. The final question for James Dornan. Uh, can I just say that uh, on, on Ken McIntosh's last point, it may well be higher than 50 million but the possibility is that it would be much, much lower than 50 million. Is that correct? It, it is my aim to keep it. I, I would like to deliver a zero disallowance in the next programme. Thank you very much. See, when the, the original business plan was put in place, did, was there any flexibility in it to combat possible EU changes to the specifications? I, sorry, I, I don't know. I, the, the original business plan had a figure in it with a lot of caveats because we didn't know at that point what the complexity was going to be. Uh, as I said in, in my opening remarks, we were promised a much simpler cap and we didn't get it. Uh, and, you know, to be fair, as we began to work through even the basics of the system, it became clear from an early stage that this was going, you know, that our, that our caveats were going to all be used up. We, you know, we, we should have um, taken a much higher degree of, uh, of uh, what's the word, optimism bias in terms of, of the figure that we came up with in that. But given, given the, the, the level of the changes that were required, uh, the ICT report, which was mentioned earlier on, wouldn't really have been much use to you in this case, would it? I mean, you, you, uh, you couldn't... If you had no idea of the scope they were going to be, be asking for changes, then you wouldn't have been able to, to manage that earlier on, would you? No, I, I think Audit Scotland's ICT report was helpful in giving us the checklist, but it's principle how we manage and run programmes uh, and we have adopted that generally across government. We've just delivered um, Scottish Wider Area Network, which is about 240 million. Again, to time, using that checklist, we're bringing in GLOW, the uh, IT system for schools, again, on time. So you're, it, it's a very helpful report and checklist for governance, resourcing programmes, but it doesn't help you... Um, scope the cost of a particular programme. Yeah, the, and the last question that I would ask is that, uh, again, it, it refers to something that's just been, been mentioned uh, about the farmers' payments and the, the, the deadlines, etc. As part of the reason why you scale back to make sure that you, and I think you said this earlier on, but why you scale back on some of the periphery stuff, which might be an unfortunate phrase to use, but the, the, the less central stuff uh, was to ensure that everything was in place to make those deadlines of May next year and December uh, next year. Uh, absolutely. That has been our predominant aim in the programme, is to make sure it is delivered to those regulatory deadlines. Um, when we look at each of the, the little parcels of software, discuss them with our contractor, you know, we, we want to make sure nobody's gold plating, putting anything unnecessary into it, that we're doing it in the most efficient way as possible, um, and that we're getting the right teams and their con you know, and the contractor staff to build that software to do it as quickly as possible. We track their productivity. We're working with them to make sure that they have got the right staff working in those things, and their productivity is, is you know, is coming up. And again, that helps give us some... Uh, some assurance around our ability to meet these tight deadlines. Sorry, I've got a very last, last one, if you don't mind. Uh, can I just ask, are you confident that you will be able to achieve these targets? The closer mm. we get to them, the more confident I'll become. Um, you know, the, the first big release of our portal uh, in December, I am you know, very, very confident that, uh, you know, other than something completely untoward happening, 
that will be launched. Uh, as of this morning, talking to the SRO, I'm very confident that March next year we'll have the software uh, we are in place for the, the online application forms. So you know, the closer we get to each, the more detailed we can do the planning, uh, the more confident I am. We've got a, an excellent team in place. We've got a very good working relationship with our IT contractor. So you know, the more they deliver and the more they see things roll out, the more confident they become and the more confident I become in, in, in their place. Thanks very much. Can I, can I just uh, remind our witnesses that uh, the Auditor General did tell us that uh, our state delivery of the CAP Futures programme will carry significant risk right up until implementation, which most of the members have asked about today. But she also said, and beyond, uh, and I think that does co give us some uh, concern. But uh, on behalf of the commi committee... Just Clarify, can you just if you want, yes. Sir. Could, I, could I just uh, explain that uh, we we explained to the Auditor General we asked for the words and beyond to be added um, because even when we have a fully compliant um, IT system, um, we know from previous experience that there are many things that the European auditors will come and quiz us on, and if there are any process slips of any sort, um, or indeed. If farmers have, if, if, in, if an individual farmer has made a mistake and we have not adequately in the European Union's eyes penalised that farmer, taken money off them, um, then we will face disallowance. So it's, it was just to emphasise the fact that getting these regulatory deadlines that, that, we, that we have to meet in relation to the IT and the overall um, business change programme um, that's not the, not the end of the, the story as far as potential disallowance risks is. Much of the evidence was about meeting deadlines, but I think it is important to get that on the record. Uh, on behalf of the committee, can I thank the government officials for their evidence, and I'll suspend the committee to allow witnesses to leave the table. Thank you.
to reconvene the, the meeting and to move on to item three. Uh, the committee has a response from Glasgow Kelvin College to the Auditor General uh, for Scotland's uh, report entitled the 2012-13 Audit of North Glasgow College. Um, can I invite questions and comments from committee members? Colin Beatty. I have to say that the, what I see before me here is very disappointing. Um, it seems to be a litany of errors and misjudgments. If I look at the conclusions, which are on Annex A, page 1, if I look at these individual components, the, the remuneration committee has not met, met for a number of years, and they give reasons for this, but they're pretty weak. I mean, the, the remuneration committee should be, should be meeting periodically. The committee received inadequate management support. The committee was unaware of SFC guidance. They're paid to know. They are, they are professionals. They're supposed to be aware of this. The college had no severance policy requiring compliance with S SFC guidance. Why not? <coughs> Comment is made further down the page at paragraph 6. The governance applied to this agreement was inadequate. The chair of the board... Of the, of the board also chaired the remuneration committee. The chairman of the board also authorised the payments. I mean, you can go through this report bit by bit and just take it apart. On page 9 of the report, paragraph 45, there's no evidence that any specific HR advice was received by the committee. I, mean, I, think, I think the whole thing is absolutely shocking. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard to know where to start. Who made the decisions on gardening leave? I mean, who decided that was a good idea? It was never used. So clearly, there, clearly it was uh, poorly thought out. The, the actual report by Scott Moncrief doesn't, it, it doesn't come to any conclusion other than the actual facts, which I suppose is all it can go to. But what is the college doing with this? What's their next step? This is completely inadequate, it's appallingly poor, and it is a very bad indicator of how colleges handle these things. I would say uh, is that North Glasgow College no longer exists, but obviously it's merged into uh, Glasgow Kelvin College. Indeed, but obviously we're looking at this snapshot in time Indeed. and what happened around that. Exactly. And uh, I would say that uh, what's happened here is certainly not best practice. It's been poorly executed. And uh, I, think, I think it has to be investigated further to ensure that there's no recurrence of this. Mm -hmm. No, I, th I thank you for that. I, I can't say I disagree with uh, anything you have to say. Have any other members got... Uh, issues they wish to raise, James Dorner. Uh, thank you. My uh, concerns are around about the governance of the issue. I had, uh, I had been on a remuneration committee before and we met when required and we always made sure that our decisions were reported to the full board and were, were uh, made in public, on public record. That, to, for me, is one of the big issues. There's a number of issues round about the... the uh, the amount of money's paid and uh, the gardening leave and, and the fact that they don't seem to have complied uh, adequately with, with, with what they should have done. And I think there's certainly there are lessons to be learned. Uh, the convener's right that North Glasgow College no longer exists, so there's not really anybody who's at fault here but as a case, or, or to blame here, but as a case where we have to take the lessons from here and make sure that the SFC get that message out to the, all the colleges and any other bodies that they're responsible for. Oh, thank you, James. Uh, Colin Keir and then James, uh, Ken McIntosh. Yeah, thanks, convener. I think my interest would be find, trying to get an idea of exactly when the, uh, the or not only did the board know about this, but the role of the, the non-executive members in pulling all this together and uh, the issue in terms of going forward for me would be something along the lines of um, are the people who are in the present college system aware of the rights and responsibilities of non-executive members and you know, in pulling this sort of thing together and ensuring it doesn't happen again? 
I, th I think you're right. I think if we were looking for a template of how not to do things, this is uh, probably what we're facing today. But before looking at how we go forward as a committee, uh, Kenneth McIntosh. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, um, I think the, when you read the report, um, there's no audit trail which has been criticised and, and, and flagged up, uh, but the remuneration committee gave evidence that they were aware of the settlement and did approve it. Um, and the, the worrying line for me was actually the fact that they did not identify the full cost to the college because of either confusion or misinterpretation of the guidance from the SFC and an assumption that it would be funded. Now, the college merit process was a highly controversial one, a highly political one, uh, and something that received quite a lot of scrutiny and attention. So I'd, I'd quite like to know, uh, I'd like to be reassured um, as to what monitoring of this did take place. So I, I'd very much like to know the relationship between uh, not just this college, but the other college mergers and the SFC and the government. So I'd like to know if it's possible uh, for us to ask the SFC what they knew of this process. In other words, they knew that three colleges were coming together. They'd only require one principal, and therefore arrangements would have to be made for the other two principals. So. How, how much involvement did they have? How much notification were they given? And exactly, particularly given as uh, Colin Beatty has said, the committee was unaware of SFC guidance. I think. Well, exactly. Uh, yes. And I think I'm also right in saying that the additional funds that were required led the college into a deficit position. So, uh, that, that, that's it was exactly a very it. serious position. That's yeah. exactly it. But they, they obviously made an assumption. So the assumption, um, they, they clearly felt they were receiving assurance from somebody. So I'd like to ask the same question to the Scottish Government as well. What, how much were they kept in the loop? What notification were they given either by the SFC or by the colleges themselves? Okay. Well, uh, the options that we have uh, uh, with this report, which uh, gathering the thoughts around the table does give some serious uh, cause for concern, we can note the response. Uh, we can seek further written or oral evidence on the issues raised in uh, Section 22 uh, from the government, from the Scottish Funding Council or other relevant stakeholders and I'm aware that we are looking forward for assurances. Uh, alternately, we can refer the port report to the Education Committee. Um, so can I go to Colin Beattie, then Bruce Crawford. Can I suggest we, we need uh, some further comment, certainly from the Scottish Funding Council. Uh, and Are you talking about oral evidence? Uh, on this? Maybe written. Okay. And, uh, which will allow us to look at what they say and decide whether it's something that should be taken further forward. Mm. I think maybe we need to look at some of the other stakeholders. Indeed, uh, it's difficult with the college not being there Indeed. anymore. Otherwise, you would call yes. on them to come forward. Yes. But I think certainly the SFC, uh, my concern is that if this college was unaware of their guidance, uh, you know, we do need an assurance with the, the new college structure moving forward. Bruce? Well, I'm with Ken here. I think Ken is the nail on the head here in terms of the specifics um, on this college. I think we certainly need to go to the, the Funding Council to ask them what they knew about it, what guidance was available to the college so we can actually see what that looked like. Um, and on the generalities, I think a general assurance from the SFC and the, the, from the Scottish Government about, although it will be difficult for the Scottish Government to, to depending on what's happening in each individual college, because obviously there were independent bodies at that time, but what they knew, what they knew of the other processes. Okay, are the committee content then? Not, but, not, but I do recognise how tough that might be for the Government to actually get that information, because it will not be easy. Well, I, I think we're really looking forward here, as you say, North Glasgow College no longer exists, so we want an assurance that uh, we're not looking at the worst of practice, but we're looking at the best of practice in future. So are the committee content that uh, we write to the SFC and the Scottish Government to Can seek the right Scottish Government the answers? For? It was Bruce that raised Scottish well, Government. Yes, yes, I know both this and Ken, but I mean... The same question is just to find out... Um, the, the college themselves seem to be under the assumption they were getting well, funded. That, the funding came from, from the support that the, the right. guy, but I mean, so, so I just like to find out the government. Did they did they have any contact, direct contact? What was the involvement? Because this assurance um, clearly isn't auditable. 
So I'd just like to the government to say, what did they know about the process? How, how much were they kept informed? How much direct uh, involvement did I mean, they I'm, have? I'm happy to write to them. I just don't really understand what it is that we're right to ask them. Are we asking them, did you tell somebody, don't you worry, we will give you money to pay people off? Yes, and I mean, just to find out what their involvement is. Uh, surely does. that's the role of the Scottish Funding Council to, to have managed that. I would have thought that was the obvious place to write. But if, if you think there's a benefit be, to writing to both... The, the I think it would also be anything. helpful, James. Uh, gardening leave was uh, mentioned by uh, Colin and others. And I think given that we have a, a smaller structure of fairly successful merged colleges, it would be nice to get an assurance from the government that uh, the, the yeah. guidance is in place and that no one can plead ignorance in future. That's the way I'm looking at it. Uh, so we write to the Scottish Funding Council and the government to seek the assurances that have been raised by members of the committee today. Is, is that agreed, Bruce? First of all, just make sure we know exactly what we're doing here. Okay. First of all, on the specifics of the college, Yes. what guidance was available to them? Yes. What information? What what, 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 is, what did the Scottish Funding Council and the Scottish Government know about it? But more general terms, um, in terms of the rest of the college structure, assurances that, or, or what they know about what actually happened on the ground as the mergers went through. Yes, I, I think we just uh, go back to Colin Beattie's point. It's the, the conclusion in the report, uh, remuneration committee had not met. That's not acceptable, as James Dornan has said. The committee received inadequate management support. That, that's not, not reasonable. The committee was unaware of SFC guidance. I don't think that's acceptable as an excuse. And the committee had no severance policy requiring compliance with SFC. So I think moving forward, if we can have an assurance that uh, these are in place, that lessons have been learned. Uh, uh, is that all right? <laughs> Finally. Willie. Thank you, Convener. Could I just add in a, <coughs> a further comment from, from seeing uh, uh, examples, perhaps not similar to this, but in the same kind of issues about account governance and accountability. For, for me, uh, I mean, putting guidance in place doesn't guarantee that people will implement or, or even read that guidance, and we've seen a few examples of that over the years uh, here. So how ultimately do we, uh, our boards and colleges are accountable? so that we can make sure that they practice and put in place the guidance that's issued to them. Because we expect them to do it, and we hope that they will do it, but how do we make sure that they do it? Because yeah. you, would, you, you would hate to think that, that something like this could, could occur again without any accountability line. No, I think, I think that's a very good point. I think that's a, a reasonable you know. point, uh, and that's something that we can ask the Scottish Funding Council. But I just think it's unacceptable to say the guidance was there, but we didn't know about it. Please. In terms of Willie's position, I think what we should do is ask the Scottish Government to explain how the changes that have been made to the college structure yes. will improve this. Yeah. Indeed. That's Indeed. The real, that's the real issue. Indeed. Yes, I, 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 think, I, I think moving forward... The governance, how it used to work, was that these were very much standalone organisations. Indeed. It's not, it's not quite as much... Exactly. Much tighter. So has, have, the, how, have the new arrangements made... Well, how will they make it better? I'm quite happy to do quite a detailed letter covering these points, which will be circulated to the committee to make sure that the issues uh, that you're concerned about uh, are covered. Uh, are we agreed with that? Uh, our next uh, item four is a section 23 report on reshaping uh, care for older people. Uh, again, this uh, report was looking at the progress three years into uh, a 10 year programme. Um, and uh, the Scottish Government have committed to provide further information um, on some of the committee's uh, recommendations once ongoing work has been concluded. Uh, can I invite questions or comments from members on reshaping care for older people? Uh, we have uh, various options. We can note the responses. We can require uh, request further oral or written evidence. We can highlight issues to the Health and Sport Committee, or we can ask for uh, a progress update um, on any report recommendations in the next Scottish Government progress report, which is due in May 2015. Uh, Kenneth, uh, thank you, Kevin. Yeah, this was. Uh uh, quite a worrying report from the Auditor General, if you recall. Um, I think the, the comments were that uh, there was limited evidence of progress being made. In fact, instead of shifting resources from the acute sector to 
community care, what's actually happening is the community care budget is going down and the acute sector is going up. And we heard evidence that there's a number of um, policy pressures on the sector uh, and as well as uh, reshaping care for older people, perhaps the bigger one is just waiting list targets and other things. They have priority. And you might say, well, they're not meeting those targets, mm -hmm. either, but that's a separate issue. So it, it was felt that you know, they're not actually making progress and there was limited, and, and, and therefore that's, it's an unsustainable situation. If I, th I think there are concerns. I think Exhibit 11 uh, illustrated that out of uh, all the commitments, three out of eight have made progress. Exactly. But I do appreciate that we're three years into a 10-year programme. Exactly. So yeah. it's uh, well, I thought that the, the taking that into account. Exactly. So now we, we've had an evidence session on this already with yes. Paul Gray. Uh, I, don't think there's, I don't see much point in going back over it again. No. Uh, there was a promise under paragraph 7, however, uh, which is that the government is working to develop indicators and outcomes for integration. And I assume, that, and, and will in fact come back to the committee uh, with this next year. Yes. Um, so I, I'll be honest with you, although... Um, you know, we have, we've got concerns and we've aired them. And I, I'm not sure the response entirely addresses them. It just talks about what's already happening and clearly yes. isn't making a difference. Um, yes. It is going to come back to committee uh, and I'm quite happy to... I think we do create. receive a progress report. We, we have, of uh, course, done, uh, done our own report on that. I just don't feel that we can truly expect every eight recommendation to be met within three years. But I, I think we are looking at the progress, which I appreciate is disappointing. Yeah. Really. Thanks very much, Convener. I mean, let's remember that this is an additional £100 million that's going into support health and social care partnerships uh, and so on. And one of the issues that came up at the committee was the integration of data, localised data, to help us to manage the processes better. And you can, members can see from the government response on page three there the rather catchily titled Health and Social Care Data Integration and Intelligence Project <laughs> will enable local authorities to link social care data with health data. That, that was one of the issues that comes up from time to time, convener, about how these mm. different systems and areas of responsibility that were probably <coughs> sort of independent previously are now coming together. And of course, the burden to, to bring together data that manages that and gives, gives us the, the right. So I'm pleased to see that, but I don't underestimate the difficulty that that, that could, could bring us, particularly when you look around Scotland, for example, and you see GP systems are kind of different all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of wondering how, amongst all the health boards and local authorities, we'll, we'll proceed with that. But I'm, I'm happy to keep an eye on that and get some progress on that as it, as it develops, because it's, it's crucial, it's about data management and it's about doing it correctly for, yes. for patients. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more, so I think basically we do have uh, some concerns, but uh, Bruce? Uh... I think I, I agree with the general thrust that we need to come back at a later date, yes. but I think to me one of the key paragraphs was paragraph two actually, yes. that, that highlighted what they're trying to do to sh shift the balance of care and the various yes. methods they're trying to employ and then suggested further down that there may be savings available from the acute sector and that. Yeah. Well, I, for one, am not convinced that they may get savings, but that doesn't mean to say, of course, that that will transfer into care in the home, for instance, because we all know the huge pressures are on the health service, and while there might be savings in this area of the acute, that not necessarily means that it's going to automatically come into mm -hmm. other parts of the service. Mm -hmm. It may have to remain acute to allow them to continue to deliver. So I'd just like to understand when we get that, update, if there are savings going to be identified, actually where are they going to be applied? Well, I think your comments are on the record. Can I ask uh, colleagues, uh, and I think we don't underestimate the, the complexities of this issue, can I ask colleagues if they are content to note this response, given that uh, we will receive a Scottish Government progress update in May next year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, our next one, I think... Uh, Probably got Kenneth McIntosh's name all over it. Section 23 report, managing early departures from the Scottish uh, public sector. Uh, we've had evidence from the Scottish Government to uh, the Auditor General's report. And uh, can I just invite some questions and comments from members on this uh, issue? Seeing as I've named you, Kenneth, I'll straight to you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Kavira. Mm -hmm. uh, just to remind members... Um, what. The, the, the evidence we've heard in this, we, the Auditor General produced a report which um, flagged up uh, weaknesses in the approach to early departures. Uh, we also had, uh, as we took evidence on this, 
um, we, we explored further difficulties about the use of uh, confidentiality or gagging clauses. And in response, uh, I think you remember this, we had, had a very, not very uh, satisfactory response originally from the head of the civil service. Um, but in response, the government has changed its, its practice and its policy, or at least it says it's going to. The difficulty, of course, we've got is that it said it had a policy of not using confidentiality clauses in the health service, but we know that not only does it use them, it uses them virtually in every single example, and it's been growing every year. So, so there's, a, there's clearly the worry we've got is, uh, are we able to monitor uh, the commitment not to use the, uh, these clauses? Now, that what the government's going to do from now on is that they are going to report annually to Parliament, and not only that, they've expanded uh, the number of bodies on which it will report, and it will collect the information centrally. That, I have to say, is to be applauded, and I look forward to seeing that report. The only points I'd make really are that, uh, although it will report on settlement agreements, it won't report on voluntary redundancy, So, um, which, as you can imagine, is one of the biggest uh, costs and one of the biggest uh, schemes. I think it's perhaps worth noting, given the, the previous agenda item, on the redundancy programme for uh, senior management at college colleges, that it's it's very important that Parliament itself is able to at least cast an eye, if not ask further questions, about how much money is being spent, because we are talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds, huge sums of money being spent on redundancy, and the second part being the confidentiality agreements. I'd also just make the other point that, although the Police Scotland, and the, I should say, although the Police Authority is covered. Police Scotland specifically is not. In other words, police officers, um, settlement clauses and, and uh, redundancy payments for police officers are not uh, covered. Um, it's just something to bear in mind because we do know there have been a couple of cases where they reported of officers leaving, being given very generous settlements and then being re-employed a matter of weeks later in some cases. Um, similarly, uh, universities, I'm pretty sure colleges are covered, but universities aren't. So it's really just to bear those in mind, but otherwise I, happy to note and, and yeah. delighted the government is going I to do agree with you. I do think uh, we have <laughs> moved forward on this issue and there is now a presumption against uh, confidentiality clauses and I think it's fair to say that there is more transparency. Whether there is enough is something else and uh, the Auditor General is in the room, so I'm sure she's heard what you're saying about Police Scotland. Uh, Bruce? Crawford, did I you want? I agree with you just note it, but uh, yes. Ken made some pretty sweeping statements, and, and yeah, without going looking at some of the numbers, I'm not prepared to accept what Ken said in terms of health service. I need to go and look at it just because you said it, it doesn't make it right, Ken. Can't be safe to say that. Well, I think I, I, I think what Kenneth was talking about was what what was historical. Yeah, but, We're actually but, but, moving forward. But the main point is, in terms of voluntary exit schemes, it's yeah. entirely clear from the letter we got from the. The, the head of the civil service, the numbers of staff leaving the voluntary exit schemes and associated costs are reported in the consolidated annual accounts for each public body. They are reported centrally to Parliament. Mm -hmm. So there is oversight by this Parliament of that and aspect. Can I just also remind uh, members that at the end of our last meeting on the 5th of November, the Auditor General confirmed that she will report back to the committee with further information on the number of settlement agreements and the use of confidentiality clauses in the NHS, along with any concerns raised by local auditors. Let me, let me correct the record. Sorry, I made okay. a mistake. I should have put in the word not reported centrally to Parliament, but they are available for the accounts, is what I meant. Yes. I mean, there is more transparency, whether it's in, in, enough is something else. Are the committee members uh, agreed to note this submission uh, and uh, bearing in mind we will receive a further report from the Auditor General? Uh, great, thank you. And uh, the next one is um, on modern apprenticeships. Uh, we've had written submissions from Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Government to the Section 23 report on modern apprenticeships. Um, uh, we took evidence uh, from Skills Development Scotland as long ago as the 28th of May. And following that, we sought clarification from the SDS and the Scottish Government uh, on, on several issues. Uh, do we wish to note this submission, seek further written or oral evidence? Um, do committee members have any uh, questions or comments they wish to make? Any suggestions? James Dornan to note, uh, uh, I think this is also an issue in the Education Committee. So are committee members agreed to note the, this report? 
I'll move on. Okay, thank you. And uh, we're doing a real mopping up exercise today, so sorry about this. Um, we're now on to uh, agenda item number seven, section 23 report on self-directed uh, support. And again, we have uh, a 10-year strategy uh, running to 2020, um, and the Auditor General reviewed the early progress uh, of this report and uh, gave a commitment to continue to monitor the strategy as part of its uh, work on the NHS. And uh, just so happened I was talking to a social worker from Fife last night, and he was saying that uh, a lot of progress is being made on the ground. But uh, again, it's, uh, we've got six years before this strategy uh, will be fulfilled. Are there any questions and comments, or do committee members wish to note the report or seek further written evidence? Kenneth? Yeah, yes, I mean, I think this is clearly a major change that's taking place yes. in, in our communities and in our, ser our services. Um, one that has the support, I think, of, of um, all the parties in Parliament, parties. yes, but yes. one which is also quite painful because, uh, in many cases, it... Um, there's two, two processes going on simultaneously. There are budget cuts, but there are also changes to self-directed support, and they're happening at the same time, and yes. it's sometimes difficult to tell. So yes. a lot of daycare services provided by local authorities are being closed as people don't use their own um, budgets to purchase those daycare services. So it's, it, it's quite a traumatic process for some. But this is a particularly useful letter just because it tells us how the government is going to uh, collect information uh, about it, including, I note a survey regarding the views and experience of social care users and their carers, which I think is very useful. And I'm sure that the Health Committee will appreciate this, uh, as we will too when we come back to it in about a year or whenever we come back to it. I, I, I think it's worth coming back to, and also the complexity of the merging of the health and social care budgets, which Willie Coffey mentioned earlier. James? Yes, uh, I'd, I'd just like to say I'm, I'm delighted if everybody supports it, but, and I was really happy to hear that you had a social worker you were speaking to last night who was, yeah. was happy with it, because it's a great thing. However, yes. it would be nice if there was a more uniform way of, of, of local authorities implementing it, because yeah. there does seem to be huge differences between the way local authorities are, 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 are taking uh, SDS and running with it. And, uh, Ken touched on daycare centres, and I, I think when you raise the cost of daycare centres to a fairly extortionate, uh, exorbitant amount, then it's a disincentive for people to use them. So I think local authorities should think very carefully about it. No, I think you're absolutely right. I used to monitor how many local authorities uh, gave direct payments, which uh, went through the Health and uh, Community Care Act uh, in the first parliament, and actually Fife was always the leader in direct payments. So uh, the social worker I met last night was from Fife, so maybe they're just in the lead. But I, I, I think the committee are right. that It is worth monitoring. It is quite a complex issue. There are many changes uh, happening just now. Are we content for the time being to note this submission? Uh, thank you. I'm pleased to say we can now move into private session. And can I thank all members for their forbearance as I stand in for our normal convener, Hugh Henry. <laughs>